I will do an abbreviated version of my intro, but seeing as how my intro is very well umbrella under the theme, which is my rogue holiday, where I recruited an amazing crew of people from New York City as storytellers to tell their most insane, off-the-wall, holiday-themed stories. I will go first. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Olive, um, and the whole reason I'm here is the story I'm about to tell you. So, um, when I was 15 years old, bear with me, when I was 15 years old, um, I was trolling my high school cafeteria, and um, it was breadstick day. And breadstick day was just like the best fucking day. And I'm kind of like wandering around, like saying hi to everyone, and you know, I pass this one table, and they're like, hey, oh, like, how's it going? I'm like, oh, it's good. And I walk over there, and I say, hey, and they tell me they're doing a secret Santa gift exchange, which normally, you know, that's fine, and it's fun, but I only knew one person sitting at this table. And the one person I knew is the one person I did not get. So we do, we do the gift exchange, and we exchange names, and um, I get a girl named Lauren, and for Lauren, I am going to Bed Bath & Beyond clearance section, and I am going to TJ Maxx clear, clearance section, and I am going to like somewhere in my room to find something to re-gift, and we're going to call it good. Because I'm 15, and I have no money, and that's my idea of a quality gift. So, I wrap everything up and I put it in a gift bag and I show up on this day for a secret Santa gift exchange. And as it turns out, Lauren had me as well. So I gave her everything and you're just like, oh, you know, thanks. Like this smells like shit, but thank you, you know? And it was, it was good. And then she gives me a gift. And I remember she gave me two things. The one thing that she gave me was um, a rock. And I would make this up, but it was like one of those like um, precious stone rocks you get at like gift shop. So it was like supposed to, I don't know where it is now, but um, it's not with me. And the second thing she gave me was a journal. And so I was like, well, I've always liked writing. Like, maybe I'll give it a go. Maybe my New Year's resolution this year was I would write in this journal every single day for one year just to see if I could do it. So I did it. Um, but the interesting thing about that is, is that was December 24th, 2004. And today it is December 6th, 2014, and I haven't stopped. There's not been one single day since that day that I have not written in these handwritten journals. And five days after graduation, I packed my bags, I moved to New York City with all 12 of my journals in hand. I was like, I'm gonna see what I can fucking do with this. So I came to New York City, I started working as an unpaid intern for seven months, and then I started a blog. It's called www.allofthepeople.com. And over the course of the year, I started building a library, actually exposing what these stories were in my journal. Before, you know, we all get emotional, they were a mix of the funny, they were in the mix of the inspirational, they were chronological number of events that I'd never shared with anyone, and so many of those people mentioned are actually in this room. And many of them are gonna be sharing the stage with me today. But after I started writing on them, and I started doing it for about a year, I decided that I kind of wanted more, because as fun as it was to kind of like share my stories online, I kind of felt like we could put an interesting twist on it. You know, it was a community. It was, a, it was um, an event for people. So I started these storytelling events, and we started a partnership, and it's now my fourth show here, and I could not be more excited to be sharing it with you guys. So thank you for coming. And um, I truly think it's the best holiday present I could ever want. So without further ado, I want to introduce you one by one to my storytellers who have been practicing this for you guys and you will not be disappointed. And the openers that I have tonight have been here since the very beginning. Um, it is Jim Andrinos and Joe Esmond Shade. And um, it wasn't until tonight, 10 minutes before the show, where they told me what they were going to say. So without further ado, let's bring Jim and Joe up to the stage. Yeah! How is everybody doing today? I'm Joe. This is Jim. I'm Jim. This is Bud. How are you? That's my button. All right, that's your button. All right, so this is, this is uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of homeless in New York, and, and Christmas time is, is a wonderful time for the homeless. Yes, we, it is. We love it, don't we? I think it's the best time. I do. It's, everything's so bright and shiny, and people are just oh so happy to see us when you're walking through the streets. But I heard you, uh, you went to, uh, you left the city. 
I did. I left the city at the request of the New York City Police Department. Uh, you're picked up several times. They, uh, they do have this lovely program with the homeless people where they go, do you have a relative in another city? And if you say yes, they give you bus fare to go see the relatives. So they found out that I have a cousin in, in Arizona, so they Ooh. sent me. Uh, to Tucson, Arizona. Well, that must have been nice for Christmas time, you know, being warm and sunny. Uh, let me just tell you, there, there is nothing shittier than Christmas in Arizona. <laughs> for a home, Well, for anybody, but for a homeless person in particular. Because, you know, if you're homeless in New York, you've done it. You, during the holiday time, you go into Central Park, you find a nice tree, and, and you sleep under it. It's very festive. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's the, the desert. And the, you ever try and decorate a cactus? That is not good times. <laughs> I've never tried. You ever that. try and hang an ornament on a cactus? You don't even need to hang it. You just push it and it sticks there. It's not fun. It's crazy. So I, I was, I was in the, I was in the, de and then this, this, these are my clothes, and you wear this in 110 degree heat, and chances are you, you don't smell pretty good. And, and, Probably and not. It was awful, and and nobody's reveling, and it's a city where you drive as opposed to New York, so you can't even find the spot where you can, you know, get some change. Oh, and, no. and, yeah, you know, so. Uh, and uh, so I get all the way there, and I spend Christmas there, and, and the, I got the best Christmas gift at all. Ooh, what was yeah, that? My cousin gave me a ticket to get the fuck back to New York. <laughs> so that was well, a we missed you, buddy. For me. Glad and to I have missed you, back. you too. Um, okay, so next up, we have my friend Megan. Megan is actually another fellow writer in New York City, and we um, discovered this once when we were out um, and drunk. I was like, You're a writer? I'm a writer. And we talked about it for a while, and I coerced her to. <laughs> Do these storytelling events with me, and it took a little bit of coaxing, but she did. She did one before, and she blew us away. So I was lucky enough to have her come back again. So everybody, welcome to the stage, Megan. Um, Megan. Hello. Okay. So my story was called "There's a Baby in a Manger in Suburban California." Um, I sat in my church-appropriate floral skirt and cardigan at six sharp. My mother grabbed her purse off the hooks by the door. All set? She asked. Why doesn't Logan have to come, I said. Because he has soccer practice, and since you decided to quit playing sports, you get to come with me to the live nativity performance. Now come on, we're going to be late. So we got in the car and pulled out of the driveway. We reached the event location and sat in our plastic lawn chairs in the church's back parking lot. Conveniently, this was on a hill. Its dramatic slope making our seat arrangement mimic that of an auditorium. There were Christmas lights beaming from the tree on the left that had been roughly arranged in the shape of a cross. Programs with line drawings of Mary, Joseph, and baby were placed neatly on each of our seats. I grabbed mine off my chair before sitting, sitting down, wondering to myself how many people had sat on the face of Christ before being politely told their indiscretion by their nosy, do-gooder neighbors. I flipped through the small pamphlet, trying to get a time estimate. Although there was no end time, I estimated by the number of hymns that we'd be sitting on this hill for about the next hour and a half. Everyone whispered as they slid into the rows of plastic chairs, politely trying not to interrupt the show that had yet to begin. Then, suddenly, the whispered conversations turned into hasty and hushening, and the crowd fell silent. A bright light fell onto the stage from directly above the raised platform. The light fell from a flashlight, being held by a scruffy-looking man I recognized from Sunday service as the custodian. The sacred family sat in the yellow light, Mary in a pile of hay with her hair covered and her arms coddling what one could assume was the baby himself. Joseph, played by someone who I had seen at the spot at least once, but, but before, but I couldn't remember his name, lacked the facial hair that his biblical self was portrayed with. The spot was really just where the railroad tracks, tracks met the aqueduct in my hometown, the location where 14-year-olds went to drink King Cobra and smoke blunts. But back to the nativity scene. He kept his gaze down, fixed on the hay right below the baby, and I assumed this was in an effort to keep himself from being recognized. I'm sure he would catch hell from his friends if they saw him playing the world's most famous and piously understanding cuckold. Mary lifted her gaze. I didn't recognize the girl who played her, but she was about my age. She was rather striking, with olive toned skin and dark brown eyes. Her parted lips coated in a shade of lipstick that was certainly not available in BC Bethlehem. And she started to sing. Her voice was sweet, melodic, melancholy with a dressing of youthful, ignorant cheer. She was mesmerizing. I allowed myself to succumb to the force that 
seemed to consume us all. She closed her eyes, revel revealing a slightly metallic eyeshadow, one, one that, again, seemed slightly anachronistic. Whoever was responsible for the makeup in this production was clearly not going for accuracy. But her voice, her voice kept me and everyone else sitting in these white plastic chair lawn chairs enraptured. But then it ended, and it was too soon, and you could feel the desperation in us all for her to just keep singing, just to keep feeding us the melodic tranquilizer. But the pause lasted long enough for us all to realize that the hymn had ended, and just as soon as all of our hearts sank, the little baby Jesus started to cry. I hadn't even realized that the wad of fabric entangled in her arms was in fact a living, breathing baby. Just as abruptly, Mary had stopped her as, sorry, just as abruptly as Mary had its in had stopped her entrancing song. A white shape appeared above the manger to deliver a message. The actor baby Jesus stopped, start, was startled and stopped sobbing. He flung his arms around vigorously, the way that many babies do, with baby mo mobiles dangling in their faces. The janitor flicked his wrist and shifted the spotlight to the shape above the manger. An angel, only it wasn't an angel, it was Sophie Mendez. I know her, I blurted in a yelled whisper, warranting more than one quieting glance. From school, my mom inquired, but her whisper at a far lower volume and meriting many fewer judging glances. Well, I think it's great that she's taking part in something with the church. Sophie Mendez was colloquially known as the class slut. She had performed fellatio in the bathroom between third and fourth period yes, at Sophie. least once. And there were even rumors of her making out with the science teacher, Mr. Camino. And here she was, the angel, delivering the news of the Messiah to his parents. She looks gorgeous, my mother whispered. You should try to be more like her. She's active in the community. I swallowed my laugh. Yes, Mom, she's definitely active. <laughs> Sophie Mendez was quite pretty. And tonight her hair had been barrel curled, her highlights retouched. She was wearing her trademark low-cut tank top. But even through the oversized white cloak-like attire, you could see that she was gorgeous. Or she wasn't wearing, sorry. Anyway. Continuing, uh, I looked back at the nativity scene and noticed actor Joseph was checking his cell phone, trying to hide it behind his leg, out of sight from the crowd, but in Sophie Mendez's direct line of vision. She shot after Joseph a look. It might have been hinting to tell him to put his phone away, but it looked more like a lover's spat. Was the angel sleeping with Joseph the whole time? The plot of this nativity scene seemed to be slowly deteriorating into a poorly written soap opera. Mary. The melodic mother, whose soothing voice could hypnotize, flipped a piece of hair behind her shoulder through the fabric. The motion was unmistakable. And although it was subtle enough that it almost went unnoticed, Mary rolled her eyes. Woo! Yeah! Yeah! I don't know if anyone else is into video games, but I'm, I'm a PlayStation guy all the way. Woo! And the Sony PlayStation 3 is coming out on Friday the 17th. So I'm like freaking out. I had been saving up my money from working at this liquor store. <laughs> Different story, 16, 17 year old working at a liquor store, but I'll save that for the next time maybe. Um, so I'm saving up my money. I've got like $400 cash and I knew that on Friday I was gonna get that PlayStation. Because what does every kid want for Christmas? Every fifth year? The next generation console looks for me. Um, and I got it every time. But. So this time, it was like, my parents were like, we're not getting that for you. Like, it's ridiculous, it's a $300 system. Every game is $60. You're gonna want like five controllers, those are $50 each. Like, no, it's not happening. We'll buy you a game, maybe. And like a sweater. Um, so that, that just wasn't gonna work for me. I was like, I have to have this. Um, so we're watching the news, Tuesday night, Cleveland, so it's like very cold. Bitter. We're watching the news and we see like, oh, lines are building, they're building all this drama. They're like, lines, lines are growing for the PlayStation 3, like we've never seen something like this before. It's, um, I mean, back in 2006, Black Friday wasn't really as intense as it is, but uh, so people hadn't seen those crazy lines yet. This was, this was a week before Black Friday. Um, so everyone's getting in line and I'm, I'm freaking out, I'm like, shit, I'm not gonna get that PlayStation. They're going to be sold out. There's there's a hundred thousand releasing in the U.S. on Friday. I have to be there. And my mom's like, "You're crazy." And I'm like, "No, no, you don't understand. Like, I I'm going. I have to be there." What parents in their right mind lets their kid take four hundred dollars cash and go get in line on a Tuesday night in Cleveland 
to wait for a game console in the middle of winter. Mine. Because they were happy I was out of the house. Like, Have fun. Um, so, I, I had to go. I get there, it's Tuesday night. Um, I arrive, there's only two people in line at this Best Buy that I went to. Yes! Like, this is the best. I have my lawn chair, I prop it up. I'm wearing sweatpants, a sweatshirt, and a winter coat. And then I realize, it's 26 degrees. I'm in Cleveland, it's snowing. I'm sitting on a sidewalk, like, what the hell am I gonna do? People are starting to line up behind me, and I'm like, shit, I, like, I can't leave. There's already, there's, at this point, there's 20 people behind me. And I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stick it out. I've got, you know, only, only two days to go. I'm like feeling very optimistic. Um, luckily, like you were, uh, like I was just saying in her story, there was an angel. Uh, the guys in front of me were angels. They, they were like, hey, we brought an extra tent. Do you want it? And I was like, uh, yeah, I'm sitting here shivering on a sidewalk. I absolutely want it. So I'm like pitching this tent on a Best Buy parking lot <laughs> while like, people are going in and out of the store because it's still like 9.30 p.m., it's closing hours, people are getting Christmas gifts, and I'm like putting this tent up, um, freezing cold, skinny little kid, that's where this plays into it. And finally I'm like, okay, good, like, I, got a, I got a good setup, I got a good setup, I feel this. Um, so I'm getting comfortable, as comfortable as you can get in a tent with no padding on a, you know, a, a concrete sidewalk. It's not very comfortable, if anyone has any questions about that. Uh, but I was a Boy Scout, so it was totally fine, because like, I was used to camping in much more severe, severe conditions. Um, but for some reason, while I was in line, like, I have this organizational thing about me. Some people call it OCD, I just call it, you know, OCD. Um, and I, I had to have a list. I was like, nobody is getting in front of me in this line. Not a single person. So we have a list going. I'm number three. Um, there's 32 people in line by this point, and I have every single person's name. Um, nobody knew my name. I knew their name. Nobody knew my name. I, I became the list guy, which is okay. Like I'm fine. I'm, I'm nameless. I'm right at the front. Um, the guys in front of me would not take that role because they're like, you're gonna get murdered. Um, but, I was like, oh, that's fine, 17 year old kid, I'm stupid, whatever, I'll do it. Um, this guy holds a lot of responsibilities. Like, if you think about it, there's, you're at Best Buy, you're in a parking lot, the bathroom situation only runs from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. when it closes, and then you're on your own. Like, food situation, um, whatever restaurant you can get to nearby, but being this guy, I enacted a rule. You had 30 minutes, and if you were not back in line, your name went off the list. And this was the weirdest thing, because there are like 25 to 45 year olds waiting in line, listening to this 17 year old that's like orchestrating this. And I got up in someone's face at some point, because he went to Golden Corral, and had dinner with his family, and he came back, and I was like, no Dave, you are out. Like, no, I'm sorry, and we like, in this, and everyone's like, oh, this guy, he's got this. Like, no, David's not this guy. <laughs> So, at the end, I get my ticket. The guy comes in. It's actually a police officer who's handing out the tickets. That's like how severe this is. They have 10 top model PlayStations, and then the next 20 are like the lower model. It's not as cool, but like, you can still play games. Um, but I, I was getting the top model. So, like, four USB ports, memory stick, uh, mini USB, uh, things that they don't even put on a PlayStation anymore because you don't need it. It's actually really dumb that they had any of that stuff, but it was Sony just like mentally masturbating to themselves when they put all this stuff in there. Oh, they're like, ah, oh, technology. But really unnecessary, but I needed that one. I needed that one, and I got that one. And I got my ticket. Someone offered me $700 for my ticket. And I said, fuck you. <laughs> this, is, this is how delusional I was getting. I was like, no, 42-year-old man. Fuck you. Fuck your 10-year-old kid you're trying to buy this for. I've been here for three days. This is my PlayStation. So finally, they let us in, one by one. No mad rush, very organized. I was actually very impressed. Like, the police presence in Copley, Ohio was top notch. Um, 
very timely. We've seen some like crazy police stuff recently. Um, anyway, so they let us in one by one. I get my PlayStation. I get one game. I get one controller. It comes to like three ninety eight and tax. Throw it on there. I walk out with my PlayStation. I'm so happy. I talk to my friend Fayez. I call him first. I'm like, hey, I just got my PlayStation. And he's like, hey, me too. I put one on pre-order, I just picked it up. Oh! <laughs> yeah! Tonight, suffered further to Olivia. Yeah! So one year, I think I was 11 years old, my family decided to go to New Jersey to visit my aunt for Christmas. So we drive up there, and we're so excited, and you know, we're seeing family and everything, and I guess, you know, I wasn't privy to this, but I guess, um, Christmas Eve on the 24th, my mom looked at the tree and said to herself, wow, Isabel, my sister, has three times as many presents as Olivia does. And so she was like, oh shit. So she sends my dad out. She's like, look, I have to cook dinner. I have to do all the shit. Please go get Olivia some presents. My dad's like, totally, I'm on. I got this. For those of you, my dad is the greatest person on the planet. So wonderful. So. Of course, I'm not aware of any of these things. I get up Christmas morning, and there's just all these awesome presents. I'm so excited. All these huge boxes with my name on them. My sister opens her presents. It's just the greatest thing she's ever wanted. I open my first one. I pick out, I pick out the biggest box under the tree. I'm like, yeah, what's this? I open it up. And it's a giant tennis ball. <laughs> it's, it's that big. And I'm like, and my dad's going, <laughs> I'm like, uh oh, I'm like, oh, like, did I miss, did I miss something? I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, my mom and I talked about this. I wanted sparkly jeans. Like, I wanted something with sparkles. God damn it. Whatever. So, I mean, I guess it was kind of on me for not giving her a specific Christmas list, but I just, I wanted something bedazzled. I don't know what it was, but a giant tennis ball was not it. So, okay. my sister opens present number two, and she starts crying with happiness. And I'm like, oh, okay, this one's going to be awesome. So I pick the present out that has, you know those presents that have, like, all the different boxes? And you're like, fuck yeah, this one's going to be good too. <laughs> so I open it up, and inside are, um, a four pack of ultra bright toothpaste, <laughs> scotch tape, <laughs> glue sticks, and a, a ribbon, just like a ribbon <clears throat> that says homework champ. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and my dad's like, yay! And I look at my mom, and my mom's just like, damn it. <laughs> And I'm like, you know, I, I was raised not to be a grab, but my sister, I think she just got like six trips to Disneyland and like a like, lifetime supply of ice cream. And I'm just like, <laughs> so, so, yeah. So the final present um, is my dad's like, okay, Olivia, I really think you're going to be really excited about this one. And I'm like, this is it. These are my bedazzled jeans. Like, this is like... It, and I open up my present as an 11 year old girl on Christmas Day. And it is an Allen Iverson 76ers basketball jersey. <laughs> I mean, AI was pretty sweet, but I was fucking 11 and I was a female. So I was like, and my dad's just going, Yeah! <laughs> I'm like, Am I missing something? So. so anyways, I was thinking about this story and in my head in the past, it's always been really funny and it's a great family memory, but ultimately, you know, the takeaway for me was that I've never remembered any actual gifts that I wanted on Christmas, but I remember this family story of just hilariousness. And, and you know, my parents and the people that I love try to make Christmas good for me. So. Um, I think the, hol the holidays are a time for everybody to just remember that it's important to, to do things that are good for the people all around you and that you love. And yeah, happy Woo! holidays. Um, so I'd like to bring to the stage Woo! Billy at the hotel.
So she's gone. We're walking down the street. She is like, she doesn't even know that these guys are even like in in the fucking like in the system. So these guys walk across the street. They come up to us, and the guy, like the two guys, like they they seem they seem okay. They seem a little drugged up, but they they, they have this atmosphere of, of danger. At least as a gazelle, I'm thinking they're the lions. I'm gonna I'm gonna get fucking mauled. So. I try and ease the situation. I'm like, hey guys, how about a, uh, a shot of tequila from my um, my Tupperware uh, jar that I happen to have uh, on the side? So I, 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 I go and I, I, I start to try and like, you know, ease it out. I, I bring out the jar and I, I'm like, hey, well, you know, just pour it into like your cup or whatever. You know, we've got some, we've got some solo cups. The guy grabs a cup and I start pouring it into it. And as I'm doing this, all of a sudden a knife comes out of his coat and he tries to stab me in the stomach. So I make a fucking, like, you know, run like this and I just run. And I'm just like down the middle of the street in my dress shoes and my khakis and my stupid fucking shirt with a tie that I thought would be a good idea for a New Year's party. But right now it is not a good idea. I look like a goddamn jackass. And I'm running down the street, just avoiding any kind of murder uh, that would, you know, come upon me. So I, I, I turn around at this point because I realize maybe I should, you know, see what's going on. I turn around and uh, and my friend Kelly is uh, is standing there saying, "What the fuck, guys? You gonna like try and stab somebody? Like, what is this? This is bullshit." And my girlfriend, my girlfriend has no idea what's going on. She has not a clue because. She is still on a drunken mission to get home. She has, she doesn't know that, that I've almost been stabbed. She doesn't know that, that the tequila was spilled. She has no, not a clue. She's just been walking down the street, just going like, I'm going home. Like, that's where I'm going. I, I had my bill tonight, and I'm heading home, and that's where she's heading. So she doesn't know. So at this point, the guys, the guys are still with the girl, with Kelly, but they now realize they've made a mistake. So Kelly takes out her phone and says, I'm going to call the cops. That's it. This is, I'm calling the cops. She grabs her phone out. She starts dialing 911. And as she does so, the guy that tried to stab me takes the phone out of her hands and just starts running down the street. And the guy that's with him is like, oh, oh fuck, I guess I should go too. So he just starts running along with him. So I turn around and I start heading back to Kelly to console her because her phone has just been stolen, which if you're like any other millennial in this country, that's like pretty much like she stole her vagina. Like, I mean, it's like really important. Like that's like the last thing that needs to be taken away from her is her cell phone, you know, at two o'clock in the morning on fucking New Year's. So I get back to her. She's like, you know, inconsolable. I'm like, that, this, this is dangerous. We need to call the cops. We call the police. I'm on the phone with them, I'm explaining what's happening. At this point, 
my girlfriend comes back towards us. She knows what's happened. She's she's in the loop, and she's she clearly thinks that this is an issue that she can handle on her own. So she starts heading back towards where these guys came from because she decides that she's going to take it into her own hands to handle the situation and find them and beat their asses or whatever and get back the cell phone, you know, and and and, and uh, Batman it up or whatever she's going to do. So we're waiting for the police. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still on the phone with the dispatcher. I'm telling them, you know, like what they looked like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, with their, their jackets and all this stuff. And uh, and as I'm on the phone, I turn around and I realize that my girlfriend is now no longer with us. She's not standing next to Kelly and I. She has marched up this street towards where the guys have gone. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? This is like these guys tried to fucking like stab me, and you are just you are just gonna go after them because you think, well, you know, it's college. So what's gonna happen? So I, I I drop the phone. I give the phone off to Kelly, and I start running after her. And I get up to her, and I'm like, Allison, what are you doing? These guys tried to stab me. They pulled out a knife, and they and they like literally the guy was trying to get me in the stomach. She goes. I think you're just being a little dramatic. They aren't gonna try and say, oh, come on, it's college. They're not gonna like try and murder you. It's bullshit. I'm gonna get this phone back and we're gonna go home, we're gonna have a good time, we're gonna drink more. And I was like, alright, so okay. As this happens, the police car comes whizzing down the street. Like it like, you know, it slams on the brakes, the lights are going. This cop steps out and he's like, You guys see what happened tonight? And I'm like, yeah we did. The guy's like, alright, so uh, so what's the deal? said, well, that, these two guys trying to stab me, um, he stole her phone, and my girlfriend thinks it's a good idea to chase after them. And he's like, that's probably not a good idea. Like, no, I don't think it is either. So she decides to get on the phone and call Kelly's phone, and hoping to, that, that these guys will pick up the phone and that we can somehow find them. So we're speaking to the couple, like, well, what if we go on a little stake out here, you know, and uh, see if we can, you know, like meet up with them somewhere and then they won't know that it's the cops but really it's the cops. So they're like, okay, so we get on the phone, she calls him up and she's getting all 40 with this guy. The guy picks up the phone, she's like, ooh, hey, um, you sound really cute. Uh, do you wanna do you wanna meet up? Like, I just wanna get my friend's phone back, but I would love to like, you know, hang out and like, have a drink or whatever. And the guy's like, oh yeah, that sounds really good. Alright, let's <laughs> let's fucking meet up. And she's like, okay, so the three of us, including the cop, we all hop in this police car, and we drive like to the middle of the of like the party scene where this guy has basically told us where he's going to be. So we're on the other end of the phone line, and this guy's like, "Yeah, I'm wearing a fucking like uh, Abercrombie uh, button up with uh, like a pink stripes, and I'm standing right in the middle of the street, and uh, you know, I'm just hanging out, I've got." You know, just hang just, on you know, the bros, just a wave when I see you, and what do you look like? And she's like, oh my god, you sound so hot, I cannot wait to meet you, and, and we'll like exchange numbers, and it'll be so much better. And the guy's like, oh yeah, I'm like, oh, boner. And so, uh, so we park the car, we park, we're in the police car, right? Which, mind you, I've never been in a police car before, but um, the back seats are like a play school, it's like this plasticky, you know, no vomit, no PT is gonna like. It's not comfortable. It's it's not like something you want to be in. So we're in the police car. We drive up to where this guy says he's going to be, and uh, <laughs> we're 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 waiting to see if this guy shows up because at this point we haven't seen him uh, at least with our eyes, and the other cops that are in the area are aware of him. They have not seen him, so we're kind of all it's a waiting game. So we're hanging out. My girlfriend is on the phone speaking with this guy still. He finally says, I'm on the corner of so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Come check me out. And as he says this, the cop hears what he's saying because it's on speakerphone. And then we hear the guy through her phone go, oh, 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 because he was tackled by six police officers <laughs> thinking that he had a knife and was trying to murder someone. So we literally heard a guy go from being like, oh yeah, babe, I'm gonna fucking put my dick in you tonight, to going, oh god, I'm gonna die and I hate my life. Because he was literally just punched by six police officers in the face and in the stomach. So this guy is on his stomach, they get him up in handcuffs, they take him to the station. They let us know that unfortunately we have to go to the station as well, because if we don't, then we won't be able to reclaim the stolen property. So we get back in the car, 
we head to the police station, we write down our little, uh, uh, you know, like a, a story about what happened. They bring the cell phone in. Meanwhile, we can hear the guy in the other room going, I'm fucking innocent, I didn't do shit! But we know that he did it, because clearly he has the phone. So, we get the phone back. The cop goes, all right, you guys are free to go. Obviously, you know, unless you want to press charges. We said, no, we don't want to press charges. We leave, and, uh, and we head in our way. And the only thing that bothered me about that night was the fact that we left the tequila on the street side, on the sidewalk, and then the next day when the newspaper came out, it said on the headlines, this is the local newspaper, it says, New Year's rung in by violence. It said, a local girl had cell phones stolen. And it didn't mention anything about the fact that I had almost been stabbed in the stomach by a fucking deviant of the local community. And I was... And other than the fact that the phone was retrieved, I was just a bit perturbed that I didn't have my credibility in the uh, in the instance. But uh, that was that was pretty much it, um, and uh, that's my story. Woo! Yeah. 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 Half the night um, is my friend Nick. And every time Nick takes the stage, he always tells a really incredible story, but more than anything, with a really crazy twist ending that I, more often than not, if not every time, never see coming. This time, also, we included them in that. So let's bring the stage. Nick. How are we doing? Hello, how are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so in 2005, I was living in Savannah, Georgia. I was 19 years old. Um, and I had just finished a year at Savannah College of Art and Design and then decided ah, I didn't want to do that anymore. And I dropped out and I was living there. I was in an apartment with, uh, with two other guys and in Savannah you can get these giant apartments that are a really small amount of money. So we're uh, living in this like 2,500 square foot uh, apartment for 975 a month and we have an extra living room that we just don't know what to do with. Like, there's just, there was a living room, there was a sunroom, and then there was this other living room. It granted, in retrospect, was probably meant to be a dining room, but we were 19 years old, so in our minds it was an extra living room. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how are we going to fill this space? How are we going to fill this space? What are we going to do? Um, and so I decided that I was going to go to Home Depot, I was just going to buy a shit ton of wood, and I was going to build a bar and a beer pong table. And, um, and I did, and I built this whole thing, this really nice bar with a tile top and, and a corrugated metal front with a stencil I designed myself and a beautiful beer pong table that I uh, just put this whole thing together. And, and, um, and while I was at the Home Depot, I also noticed they had a little neon open sign. I was like, well, that's fun. Well, yeah, through, through, by that and put it up on the window and it's hanging in the window. And, and very quickly we re began running a speakeasy out of our apartment <laughs> in, in Savannah. And so basically the rule was if the, if the light was on in the window, then you could ring the doorbell and come on up and, and buy a drink. Um, and it spread by word of mouth and it was called One Block Off because we lived at 320 Victory Drive. So it was one block away from, we were stoners, and we were not it was one block away from 420. Um, and, and we built up a nice little business there, uh, having an illegal bar in our apartment. Um, and as business grew, um, we started, you know, people that we didn't know were coming in, and my roommate decided that he was going to go to a pawn shop and buy a gun that we would keep under the bar. Um, unloaded, just, you know, if someone started acting out, we would pull it out and scare them and they would leave. Huh, huh, okay. As you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, we, we have this business going for a little while, and then, um, the, right after the Savannah Film Festival, it was about to be Halloween, it was about a week until Halloween, we went, alright, we're gonna have a really enormous Halloween party. The apartment downstairs has been vacant for about a month. We went to the landlord and he said, hey, what would it cost for us to rent the apartment downstairs just, you know, for the weekend? He said, a hundred bucks was it sold. So we rent the apartment downstairs, we've got our apartment upstairs, and we throw this enormous, all of our customers from the speakeasy are, are known about it. Um, other people from just the college and the town know about it, and everyone's going to come, and everyone's going to have a really good time. 
coming around this party. It's going to be five dollars at the door for a cup for the keg in the downstairs apartment, and then cash bar upstairs. And <laughs> and we had both apartments packed to the gills all night, like 350, 400 people at a time, um, at any given moment in our in our apartment. And it's it's Halloween, it's 2005, so you know you've got a lot of Batman. You've got a lot of uh, Willy Wonkas. Um, a weird number of gay cowboys. Um, we've got, what else we have? Uh, we had uh, a, a few Anakin Skywalkers, because that was, you know, the, uh, what was it, Return of the Sith? Yeah. Whatever that third shitty movie was called. Uh, and then, but only one actual full-on Darth Vader. And we're throwing this party, and people are having a great time. And my, through me and my roommates are running around trying to pay attention to everything that's going on, and like trying to keep everything in control. And we're doing a pretty good job until I'm I'm working the bar, I'm bartending at the bar, and this guy comes up, and he orders a gin and tonic, and we're out of gin. And he is not happy about that. He is hammered. Batman is not happy that we are out of gin. And Batman starts screaming at me like, "What the fuck? Why didn't you buy more?" Fucking gin, asshole! <laughs> and I'm like, dude, what? I, I, dude, we bought a shit ton of gin, and we, and he's screaming, he's yelling, and people are backing away, and they're freaking out, and it's kind of it's getting a little bit scary. And I'm, you know, this size of a person, and I'm 19 years old, and I don't really want. He's dressed like Batman, so I'm not about to go fight the guy. And so I'm like, I'm like, all right, well, it's gonna be the same. I'm starting to reach on the bar, and. I just as like my hand starts to touch this gun that my roommate had bought that we had never had to use before, but just as a, it starts to touch it, just like I can't believe I'm gonna have to use this thing. Darth Vader comes out of the kitchen and grabs the guy by the shoulders and drags him out of the apartment, down the stairs, throws him on the street, and, they, and, and I'm like, holy shit! Darth Vader just fought Batman! My childhood dream has come true! And I run downstairs and they're both gone. And I don't know who this guy is, he's dressed like Darth Vader, he's got a mask, he's got the whole thing. I don't know who this guy is, and he's, and he, and, and, and he's gone, and, and they're both gone, and the party goes back to just like fun, and everyone's having a great time. I, I didn't find out who Darth Vader was, the guy who saved my party, until about two weeks later. I was talking to a buddy of mine at a pizza place uh, called the Mellow Mushroom in Savannah, and... Um, and he said, dude, that party was crazy. I can't believe James Franco kicked that guy's ass. <laughs> I said, what? I said, James Franco was at your party. That was insane. And then he, and then he kicked the guy's ass. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? And he pulls out his phone, and he starts showing me pictures of James Franco standing in my kitchen, dressed as Darth Vader, with his mask on. Oh my God. Because of the film festival that had happened a week prior, and he had premiered a film and decided to stick around and come to my Halloween party. So that was uh, probably the most absurd Halloween. Yeah! That I've ever yeah. 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 When I, um, I was emailing Nick about the stories he's been sending, he said, Well, I've kind of got one about James Frame. I was like, Don't do that one. And that's, uh, <laughs> I love the details I need. There we go. Um, so. I have one more story tonight, and I'm going to be the one who tells it. And um, it's going to be about New Year's Eve. So, so essentially, the long story short, short, what ended up happening was, I am now in my fourth year of hosting annual New Year's Eve parties for my friends in college in New York City. And every year, I try to top myself. So this is the second year. So they've come to town the first year, it's really fun. And the second year, they come to town, I'm like, what can I do that will be even bigger than the next year? So. You know, a basic step. So what is what one night, you know, they're in town for like four days. One of the nights I'm like, I'm gonna take them to Ninja New York. Has anyone been to Ninja New York before? It's a restaurant in Tribeca. It's an incredible restaurant, and essentially it's like the whole thing is kind of like built like a labyrinth, and you get your own like dungeon, and you know, they like make stab you and your entree comes down, they like sure, pretend to light your hair on fire, it's really pleasant. And so you have great for dates. And so we, we go there, we have like a group of like ten of us, and um, not to break the surprise, but I'm going to break the surprise. In the grand finale, they always have a complimentary um, magic show. Oh. So we like walk out, whatever, and the next day is New Year's Eve, and at about 3 p.m., my doorbell goes off. He's like, don't freak out, don't freak out. 
I may or may not have hired this magician to come to our pre-game, and like pre-game, like, you know, our, our New Year's Eve party. You, know? you invited the magician from Ninja New York to come to my personal house to pre-game our party? He's like, yeah, is that like not cool? I was like, something that's not cool. A heads up probably would have been like, you know what say. He's like, oh, it's, it's fine, it's fine. So, I mean, of course, before he even tells me, he's gone to Dwayne Reed already. He's gotten a foghorn, he's gotten confetti, and he has quando, quando, quando on YouTube, like, plugged the speakers, ready for this guy to like walk in, which all happens, it's like all videotape. So this guy like walks in, he's like, what's happening? Quando, 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 confetti that it took me two years to clean up, and like this whole, it was like a whole shebang, and this guy literally does m magic in my apartment for two hours before we go. So I was like thinking about this story recently, and I was like, man, what a fucking like insane night, right? And um, I decided to do a little digging, and I ended up finding his business card. And I was like, I wonder, it's been two years, but I emailed him, and I was like, hey, listen, hey, you came to my apartment once um, on New Year's Eve because my friend asked for your number the day beforehand, and uh, you did magic in my apartment for two hours. What are the chances that you would want to come to my storytelling event on December 6th and do a little bit of a magic show for my friends? Um, and he said yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mike Patrick to the magician. The following are a series of magic tricks. I'm Mike Patrick. I am here to rock you. Woo! I grabbed this. This is an imaginary coin from the sky. You can't really see it because it's over here. Uh. This is a handkerchief. It's purple. It matches my tie. It's very important to color coordinate almost everything you have when you are a magician. I take the coin. It inexplicably disappears. It doesn't come out of this elbow, it comes out of this elbow. And then it changes oh, into a bottle. Oh! <laughs> Much like the lives of all the children I perform for, I destroy this piece of paper. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't perform for children. <laughs> my magic is designed primarily for hot girls. I place it all together into this tiny little ball. Nothing in this hand, because that freaks people out when I go into pockets with hands and they seem suspicious. <laughs> Watch the stunning choreography. It's the hard part. <laughs> Fire! Hadouken! Oh my god! <laughs> and then slightly singed, but completely. And totally. Oh. Restored. Woo! <laughs> Four rings, Uno, Dos, Trace, Da Torse. I learned how to count from you too. I hate their music. One, two, it goes right through. Inexplicably, as soon as you touch this ring to this ring, they go together. Can you check those out? You can hold on to the ring. Try to take them apart. No? Hold on to the ring like this. Right here, watch. One, two, three. It goes right through. You can let go, thank you. You can see it from both angles, both from the front, and from the side, I barely touch the rings, and they instantly go through. This is what the rings look like when they're right side in. If you want them inside out, you simply blow, and the last one can go through. You can place them back on just as easily. As soon as it touches the bottom, it goes up to the top. Grab onto the dangly ring of happiness. How did you know? Oh, and it goes through. You have two again. This instantly links back on, giving me three. You don't let go ever. <laughs> Giving me three and one, I apologize for that. I take two and two, and then finally, one and one. And if you listen, you don't hear anything. Weird. Two and two. Straight up four, and we'll see if today is a good day. First try. Lots. <laughs> Lots of mystery. I'm going to need three human beings. If anyone is from somewhere that is not Earth, please do not come up. You were raising your hand. Can you come up? Yes. Yes! yes. 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 yes.
I have this marker, the box is filled with mystery, and there is a piece of paper that I glued with a second piece of paper that got slightly wet on the floor. So no big deal there. There is a mysterious prediction inside. You are going to think of a card. Now in advance, I will specify a few things to you guys. I have a deck of cards, and because I have no life at all, I shuffled them, and I wrote 1 through 52 on the back of every card, thinking somehow I could make an inexplicable coincidence happen. I like the word in inexplicable. It has a lot of syllables, and it's fun. So you're going to think of an odd number. That's what your job currently is, Kyle. Olivia, you're going to think of an even number, and you're going to not worry about anything. Everything is going to be fine. Yay! Okay, Kyle. OK, so we'll go, with, uh, we'll go with you first. Let me see here. Mm. Yeah, we'll do two of clubs. I'm not going to draw the little clubs on there because I'll be embarrassed with myself. Uh, I asked you to think of an odd number, correct? No, he's oh, odd. you're odd. I'm That's sorry. Odd. We'll go with Kyle. Yeah, yeah, Kyle. Can you name a number that you think the two of clubs? If you see the two of clubs on my hand and I were to turn over the card and there is an odd number on the back of it, I'll give you a little hint so you're like more similar to Batman. Uh, it's a relatively low number in the scheme of 1 to 52. So, name any odd number that you would like. Seven. Seven. Sounds great. That's super low. Uh, we'll also do the, for you, we're going to use the ten of diamonds. So I'll write the ten of D. The jokes <laughs> with, ten, with Ds usually only work well with queens, jacks, and kings. Anyway. So, if you had an even number, it's definitely higher. So it's in the higher scheme of the deck of cards. So over 26. And uh, name any even number that you would like. 42. 42. The answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. Nice. Sounds good. Robinson. Here is the Jackie Robinson? What? <laughs> he was number 42. Oh, we were talking about Hitchhiker's Guide, and then you're talking about baseball. I don't really understand video games. I thought we had a lot in common. Okay, and finally, uh, I didn't want to stress you out with any of those other conditions, because you don't have any conditions. Well, you have some. You have a condition of you cannot choose a two of clubs, and you cannot choose a ten of diamonds. But you're going to name a playing card. I give you this number. This number is 45. If I had a number 45 on the back of a card, and there was a face to the card, what would the face of the card be? Um, a face card? No, no, no. Like, no, it doesn't need to be a king or anything. It could be whatever you want. But like, there's a back, and then there's a face, traditionally, in playing cards. Okay. Uh, seven of hearts. The seven of hearts. Wow. Game changer. Stole my number. It's getting real up in here. That's okay. You can gather around. Gather around. This is real wow. exciting. Wait, them or everyone? Uh, no, not everyone. That would be that would be chaos. There's way too many people here. And the thousands of people in this massive theater. <laughs> it's being videotaped. They don't know. <laughs> I cut this open. I cut this open. And the really annoying part of cutting this open is that you end up wasting all this uh, cord that I could otherwise use to truss chickens. So, uh, I made a roast chicken last night. It was wonderful. So if you get rid of this, the cool thing is that you can get rid of some of the excess, and if you do it just the right way, magic breath, you can put it back together. You can cut the little strand. Do not cut my fingers. These are super sharp. I just bought them. You'll succeed. There you go. Excellent work. No, oh, that's embarrassing. Uh, we cut this. We'll do this. Restoration technique. I'm doing magic. What does it look like I'm doing? It's, yeah, a very intense situation here. Whoa. Bam! Totally restored. Nailed it. <laughs> so you see what I'm doing? I'm doing nothing. It's bullshit. But uh, if you make it a little bit neater, this way there's no OCD here. Can you hold on to this end? Uh, hold on to it tight like this. Ready? Blow? Oh, that's not going to work. You're going to have to flick it off. This is going to destroy all of my clothing, so that'll go over right there. Cool. Are you going to be okay? I told him everything was going to be fine. 
Okay, so inside of this shoe box, it has no shoes. Inside of the shoe box are two socks. Fun! I was wearing this. Yeah, this sock is filled. This sock protects me from robbers. It protects my pool cue. Whoa! <laughs> That way it would be. I don't care if you saw it. It's a pool cue. It looks so awesome. I dropped it and there was a fucking pool cue. It was rad. It's not about if it could have extended. It's about how rad it looks. You don't watch Superman and go, oh, he's totally flying with CGI. No, you're like, he's saving the world from Zod. God. No, it's, no, no. Everything is good. Inside of this is. Uh, Less important, let's do this, let's do this. This is the correct orientation. This is, no, I want this, maybe, yes. Can you hold this? Better. Yeah, yeah. Nick! Good job, Nick. You. You're a good guy. This is a deck of cards. You may have seen it on Earth, other than the fact that all these are written on. What was uh, seven of hearts? So we'll go through here, and you can confirm that is a seven of hearts. Can you hold out your hand like this? Do not look at this card ever, I'll kill you. <laughs> and we have the seven. We have a seven. There's a bunch of numbers here. There's one, two, seven. Uh, that is for you. Yeah. Yes. So don't look at that just yet. And finally, we have the number forty-two. So somewhere there's twenty-eight, thirty, da 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 da. Forty-two. Perfect. And then this goes over here. Two of clubs, seven. Uh, ten of diamonds, forty-two. Forty-five is the seven of hearts. That is our current situation. There's a two of clubs, this is the number seven, and he said the number of seven would be on the two of clubs. What? <laughs> what the the number 42, if you remember, I had mentioned the ten of diamonds, and if you can tell what she looks like, you can see that there is a ten of diamonds there. What? Oh, what? Magic! Magic! And my girlfriend thought writing numbers on cards was stupid. And finally, it was a waste of a dick. There's a, there's a seven of hearts. What number is on the seven of hearts? Turn it over. It's a 45. <laughs> Where's everybody? Bam! Magic! Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. Just got magic! 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 So, um... That is our show, and um, I hope everybody has a rogue and magical holiday. Thanks for coming.